Hello again, everybody. Welcome back to another screencast lecture with Mr. Richards. Today we are going to focus on earthquakes with a particular focus on the types of waves. And we'll also learn about the different parts of waves as well. So, ready to get started? Let's go. Take a look at this earthquake damage. Notice how it kind of looks like a rolling feature. So you can see here that it slopes around, it goes buckles up, buckles down. It's a good way to get a look at how a surface wave could cause lots of damage. The first term we need to learn is seismic wave. So what is a seismic wave? Well, a seismic wave is a wave that travels through the earth and is caused by earthquakes. There are three types of seismic waves that we're going to be discussing in this lecture. But before we get to that, let's think about a little bit of review. First of all, where do earthquakes start? To find the location and the origin of an earthquake, we're going to want to look at faults. This is going to be the break in a rock layer or a tectonic plate. And the actual origin of the earthquake is going to be known as what's called the focus. This is where the energy of an earthquake is first released. So in this case, the focus of this earthquake is right here, deep below the Earth's surface, on a fault line. The epicenter is very closely related to the focus in that it is located directly above the focus, but on the surface of the Earth. So you could actually be standing on the epicenter you're not going to be standing on the focus. The focus is going to be deep underground on the fault line. The epicenter is directly above the focus on the ground. Earlier I mentioned that there were three different types of seismic waves. Now let's get into those specifically. What are the three different seismic waves? First type, primary waves. Primary waves, sometimes known as P waves, these are going to be the fastest traveling of the three waves. So when you're standing and you feel a tremor or an earthquake wave, the first one that's going to reach you is going to be the primary wave. That's because it's moving the fastest. So the primary wave is going to get to your location first, no matter where the earthquake has originated. Primary waves or P waves are characterized by a back and forth motion. The energy that is transferred through the primary wave is going to be a back and forth motion. A slinky is a really good way to envision how a primary wave transfers energy. If you have a slinky attached to a wall and you pull one end and then you just kind of push it forward, what's going to happen is the energy spring is going to forward and come back. Another important feature of primary waves is that P waves are able to travel through solids and they're also able to travel through liquids. And this knowledge is something that's really important for scientists on how they figure out the composition of the Earth itself because nobody has ever gone down to the center of the Earth. Here you can see if this is the focus of the earthquake, a P wave can travel all the way through from the focus all the way to the other side of the Earth. So if you have a seismograph station here and you have a seismograph station here, both of them will actually be able to measure and pick up that earthquake wave. Of course, here it will be stronger since we're much closer, but here they would be able to identify that an earthquake did occur. Let's just follow the wave going in this direction. As it goes through, the outer mantle and then hits the inner mantle, that wave is going to be what's called refracted because it's going to go a little bit slower through liquid material than through solid material. This is a good way for scientists to determine that the earth has solid and liquid composition inside of our planet. One side is slowed down before the other, forcing the wave front to change direction is called refraction. Next wave type, number two, is 
Secondary waves are sometimes called S waves, and secondary waves are characterized by an up and down motion, whereas P waves were a back and forth motion. S waves are going to be more of what you normally think of with waves with that up and down motion. And going back to our friend the slinky, this would be a P wave, what it would look like, a back and forth motion, and an S wave We'd be taking the same slinky and snapping it up and watching the wave travel through the slinky like this. Here's a couple more really important characteristics about S waves that I really need you to know. Number one is that the S waves may travel through solid material, through dense material. However, that same S wave will not travel through a liquid. And this is going to tell scientists a whole lot about what the interior of the Earth is made out of. Let's take a look at this diagram. Now it can be a little bit confusing, so bear with me, but this is the origin of the earthquake, so this is the focus of the earthquake. The first waves from the earthquake that you're going to feel are the primary waves because they're the fastest. These primary waves can be felt all the way through the earth. So here you are here at the North Pole, and at the South Pole, that primary wave could be felt. The slower secondary wave will follow to here, but it does not penetrate past this level. The secondary waves can be felt here, the secondary waves can be felt here, 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 but they cannot penetrate this area, this liquid outer core. Therefore, people in this area will not experience any of the S waves whatsoever. This area is known as the shadow zone for the secondary waves, and it's called the shadow zone because it does not experience the S waves. Like a shadow is in the dark, this does not have the S wave experience. The primary waves, it can be experienced in this area. Earthquakes generate two main types of seismic or shock waves, body waves and surface waves. Body waves travel through the interior of the Earth. The fastest of these are primary, or P waves. These compressional waves move faster in dense rock and slower in fluids. Thus, their speed and direction change. The slowest body waves are secondary, or S waves. S waves are elastic shear waves that move material sideways at right angles to their direction of travel. Because secondary waves travel only through solids, they do not penetrate the Earth's outer molten core. For this reason, there is also an S-wave shadow zone. Our third wave type is called surface waves. And what are surface waves? Surface waves are sometimes abbreviated as L waves or R waves. Surface waves are characterized by a rolling motion as seen in the diagram, the energy is going to travel in a more of an elliptical pattern as it travels laterally. So the energy is going to be traveling in this manner. Looking at this diagram, you can compare the three different kinds of waves, P wave, S wave, and surface waves. Some other characteristics of surface waves include that the surface wave may only travel on Earth's surface. It does not go through either the mantle or the core. It's only going to transfer energy through the Earth's surface. 
Another characteristic of these surface waves is that they are known to cause the majority of the damage of the earthquake itself. And you can imagine that these waves that are spinning like that in the elliptical form, that's going to throw things around in different directions. It's going to cause a lot of different damage. The slower seismic surface waves do not penetrate the Earth's interior, but follow the surface. One type of surface wave travels in a circular motion and causes damage by displacing materials horizontally. It can be very damaging. Now let's talk about the different parts of a wave. This information is transferable through different types of waves, sound waves, the seismic waves, any different kind of wave this will apply to them. Here you see a drawing of a wave and this looks most like a secondary wave. The highest point of that wave is going to be known as the crest. The lowest point of these waves, that would be known as the trough. When you look at the distance between the two crests from here to here, that would be known as wavelength. You can also take it from really any two same points. So if you take it from trough to trough, that would be the wavelength. Crest to crest, that would be the wavelength. You could even do it here from node to node. From here to here, that would be one wavelength. As you increase the wavelength, that will decrease the pitch in a sound wave. So it would give the sound a deeper pitch. As you decrease the wavelength, that's going to increase the frequency and make a higher pitch like this. For example, if you have this little kazoo type thing I made out of a drinking straw, it's a fairly low pitch, but if I So as I, as I shorten the straw, what I'm also doing is I'm shorting the wavelength of the vibration. So it makes it a more frequent or higher pitch. This is our observer kid on a stick. Hi, Dale. And where she is, she can see the top of one wave. Then as the waves go by, she can see the top of the next wave. Now the distance from here to here, the length, is called the wavelength. That's what we call it, the wavelength. Now there's another thing about waves that you can observe, and it's called the frequency. If you go to the library often, we say you frequent the library. That's how often you go there. So waves like this are coming by often, and we say they have a high frequency. If I slow it down, the waves coming by have a low frequency. If I make a high frequency sound, 1,000 hertz at reference fluxivity of 250 nanowebers per meter. You can see that the waves are close together, and the wave length is short. Equalization for NAB standard. But if I make a low frequency sound, full track recording with no compensation for multi-track reproduction. The waves are farther apart. They have a longer wavelength, and we say they have a lower frequency. So high frequency waves have the waves close together. And low frequency waves have the waves far apart. The height of the wave is known as the amplitude. If you increase the amplitude of a sound wave, you increase its volume or you make it louder. So it's keeping the same pitch versus both the same pitch. The second one is louder, so the second one has a higher amplitude or a greater amplitude than the first sound. But there's one more thing we can measure. That's the amplitude. You've probably heard the word amplifier. An amplifier has a volume knob that controls the amplitude. How big the sound waves are. So, we can count peaks to get the frequency. We can measure this distance to get the wavelength. Or we can measure this distance to get the amplitude. This is something I would like you to draw, just do a rough sketch of this wave, and you should be able to identify the four different parts. So you should be able to identify the crest, the trough, a wavelength, and amplitude. 
those four parts of the wave you should be able to identify. You should have a basic knowledge that as you increase the wavelength, you're going to make the sound deeper. And as you increase the amplitude, you're going to make the sound louder. Well, that's it, everybody. Hope you learned something, and we'll catch you next time. See ya!